Lakes just got over yesterday, wasn't it? Yep. I believe. And so this crew, um, it's Jess and Bonnie, uh, travel the country, and this is one of the ministries that they participate in. So they asked if they could just share kind of what it's about and what they do. I got a little bit of court for you. So why don't you do that? Good evening, y'all. Now, how many of you participated in the Bible reading marathon this week? Oh, yeah. Bless you. Thank you so much. Well, we are Bonnie and Jess Rodiger. We are Bible Reading Ministry International. And what we do is teach people how to have Bible readings. We push reading the Bible through in a year, reading every day for 15 minutes. That's what the Bible Reading Marathon is based on. 365 years, 365 people reading 15 minutes a day. You know, out here in the world, there is a famine. There's a story in the Bible about the four horsemen. And they talk about the famine and how much the wheat and the barley is. But look around you. There's a famine now. Right. It's not a famine of food, although some people think it is. It's a famine of the Word, the Word of God. People are not reading their Bible. They're not hearing the Bible. A lot of them are not getting the Bible in their churches. You know what this leads to. So because of that, this is why we're out here doing this. Our vision is to see every city in the United States have an annual Bible reading marathon. Just imagine for a minute what God can do. His word says it will not return to him void, but accomplish his purpose and his plan. So if every city is declaring his purpose and his plan over their city, what would America be like? What changes would happen? Take a look around you. What's happened in Detroit Lakes in this area in the last four years? Because God's word has went forth. Wow, we came this week and we got to participate and see some of the amazing things that God's done in your area. We're so grateful and thankful that you would do that. That you would stand for his word. That you would declare it from a place. And know that God is working everywhere and in everything. Because his word went forth. If we'll hear his word and obey it, wow, the changes that God can make. Well, what have we done? So let's give you a quick synopsis of what's happening this year in our ministry. January, we had a Bible reading marathon in Tanzania, Africa, at Palmetto, Florida. Okay? Uh, April, we had one in Boone County, Arkansas. May, in Carroll County, Arkansas. July, Detroit Lakes. Woo! In August, Douglas, Wyoming. And, and we already have a pastor in Searcy County, Arkansas, that contacted us this week while we're here. You've got to come and teach us how we want to have one in Marshall, Arkansas, Searcy County. God is amazing if we'll just do what he tells us to do. So number one, we cover your prayers. Please pray for our ministry. And number two, if there's any... If God lays on your heart to help us to keep the wheels going on our RV to plant seeds all across America, then we have a free magnetic cross for you, and you can see us afterwards. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing what God calls you to do. Now, why Bible reading? Uh, there's lots of scripture that says why. There's just a few that we expound on. Number one is John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How can we turn that down? How can we turn down the Word? Matthew 4.4 4 and Deuteronomy 8.3 both say, For man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And of course, my favorite, Isaiah 55, 11, God's word will not return void, but accomplish his purpose and his plan. And then uh, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16, 
all scripture is inspired by God for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. All scripture. That's why Bible reading marathon goes from Genesis to Revelation. We don't pick out the Old Testament or the New Testament. All scripture is inspired by God. The last one is 1 Timothy 4.13. It says, Until I come again, give attention to the public reading of my word. We thank you for so much for letting us get up here and just share a little bit with you. We started doing this several years ago because of the brokenness in our county between the east side of the county and the west side of the county. We have seen it come together. We've seen both sides share. We've had it in three different cities there in nine years, three years in each city. We're looking forward, and our goal there is to bring out the Bible reading for each city and get people to take hold of it. Take ownership of this and make it yours. We want people at home to take ownership and make it theirs. Not only does that help us to go on and spread the word somewhere else, but it makes it so that somebody is proclaiming the word in your area. We thank Barry Schoeder so much for taking that initiative here. He called us up one day, got our name from a friend of a friend of a friend. It's called Divine Appointments. He asked us, how do I do this? I've wanted to do something like this for a long time. We explained how we do things and then how he could make it fit for him. And he took it and ran with it. And we've since borrowed some of his ideas to make ours run smoother. The body of Christ working together. Hallelujah. downstairs or around if you want to visit with them some more about how you might participate or uh, as next year comes around I'm sure they'll be doing it again. Kick over someone's guitar all over. Test her faith. <laughs> it's kind of interesting this morning up at Higher Ground uh, we did a sermon that spoke about gentleness and how we use our words and how we think about people, and uh, there was a gal that was there, I guess I'll keep her anonymous, just I don't know, she didn't tell me that I could say anything, but uh, she took that to heart and went down to Menards, and within about an hour, she saw that work in her life. There was a young baby that was screaming, making lots of noise, and everyone was pretty frustrated about that, and she wondered why mom would allow that to happen. It came to be that the gal has about four kids, she had carts full of stuff, she was trying to get rebates at Menards, the child was crying, but this young lady's deaf. And so she happened to have gone to school just on a couple of years under this gal, and so she was said, you know what, I just changed my whole attitude, and I went up and said, can I help? And changed everything. So she called me to say, you know, it was awesome, keep, it, keep going and doing all that kind of stuff, but what was neat is that within about an hour, God took that sermon and planted it in her life. And she saw the change. And so she took it seriously, and God takes it seriously too. You mind turning these lights on now that we don't have the... We can this one. For the next four hours, we're going to be kind of looking at... <laughs> Tuesday, it's so weird how the Holy Spirit gives me sermons and the beginning of sermons, and it was about Tuesday, I thought I was having a cup of coffee in the morning, 
kind of getting, you know, we're all in for the day, and I was, had the TV on and happened to have a movie on, and it was Clint Eastwood. Now, anytime Clint Eastwood has a Western on, I'm kind of taking a look at that, and I believe it was called Pale Rider, I'm not sure. But this one was about Doris is not your head, she knows Clint well. <laughs> yes. So, it, it was a story about uh, these, these guys that were trying to gold mine, these poor gold miners, and they were trying to find gold, and there was a of course, there's always a rich guy that's trying to take over their claims and everything like that. And lo and behold, uh, Clint Eastwood comes in riding and he's a preacher. But of course, he's a preacher with a past. He's got guns locked up somewhere. And, and so anyway, he ends up being the muscle for these guys and trying to help them out. Well, part of the story was is that he had to go into town to face about six or seven bad guys. And, and they thought he was dead, but he was here. He was alive. And so he went and he went into a bank and he got this safety deposit box. And he got his guns out. And as he took his guns out, he took his collar out and put it in there and slid it back in. Isn't that kind of a lie I can see, right? So you knew he was going to change his ways and do what he had to do. And so he's going to ride into town. But the whole story is, is that one of the guys that was there, he said, I'll go into town with you. I'm going with you. And he said, no, why don't you stay home and take care of your wife and child? He said, I'll, I'll go in on my own. He said, no, I want to go with you. Clint Eastwood said this. Anyone know what he said? Suit yourself. <laughs> Boom, there's the sermon starts. That's how the Holy Spirit does it. It jumped out and it's like, suit yourself. And so I started to explore a little bit about what, what about that, that word, suit yourself, means and different things like that. And you know what? You can Google everything. And so you Google it and it talks about old English and it talked about that people would have suits made for them so they would say suit yourself. You're, you're putting a suit that just fits you and you alone. And, and so I, I looked up suit yourself and here's what it says. It says basically, okay, do whatever you want. I'm, not, I'm done arguing. You ever have that happen in your life? Somebody's trying to tell you something and finally they give up and they say, okay, suit yourself. Suit yourself. Usually ends up being negative. I was thinking about an example, and, and my brother, I'm not even going to include in this one, so he's doing bad. My mom, uh, our cousins were there, and our, my mom wanted us to go into Detroit Lakes to shop or something like that. Now, we lived about four miles out of town. That's not too far. We walked a lot, or we rode bike a lot, but for some reason I didn't want to go. And so mom got after me, and I said, I didn't want to go. And so finally she said, fine, stay home. What she was saying is, suit yourself. And so they packed up the car and they left. As soon as they left the driveway, guess what I wanted to do? I wanted to go to town. It looked like fun. And so I walked to town and I called them on Main Street. And she said, oh, you decided to come, huh? I mean, but the idea was, is it was suit yourself. And so what I want to talk about, what I think what the Holy Spirit wants to lay on our mind is to say, are we suiting ourselves up with Christ as we're supposed to put on Christ, right? Or are we suiting ourselves? Are we putting on what we want to put on because we like it? Because we want to live a certain way or do a certain thing. And so we decide that we are going to suit ourselves. Because remember it says, basically, do whatever you want. I'm done arguing. And I truly believe that Christ wants you to know tonight that he wants that none would perish. The Bible says so. That none would perish. But at the same point, we can make choices to say, no, thank you, can't we? How many of you said no, thank you many times in your life? And it took my neighbor about three or four times to finally get me. I'd, I had gone to, to, to a, you know, Sunday school. I had gone to confirmation. I had gone to all those different things, but it never impacted me. And it took him about four times, many, many years later, in 1998, finally to get me to go to Promise Keepers, and I got saved. But other than that, if he could have said, suit yourself, Brian. Man, I've been over here. This is the third time. I, I come home from church. I could just go in and have chicken for, for lunch. But no, I drive on over to your place and I say, oh, I didn't see you at church again. He could have said, suit yourself. Isn't it awesome that some people don't give up so easy on us? That they don't say, suit yourself. I tried. I'm done arguing with you. I'm done trying to convince you about something that's so wonderful. You know, there are thousands of pastors that quit the, quit the ministry every year because they're tired of trying to give people something so wonderful and the people don't want to take it. So they say, fine, suit yourself, because I'm going to suit myself and quit. And so the struggle is, is how do we accept those things? And why is it there is a battle going on where somebody has to really fight to give you something so wonderful? If I had a million dollars in my hand, how many, how many of you would I have to fight to hand it to you? Nobody. <laughs> no, we're ready to grab it in a moment's notice. But I've got something I'm trying to share with you that's greater than a million dollars. It's priceless. It's the Son, Jesus Christ. 
and to give you an abundant life. How many want that? Come and grab it. But yet a lot of people say, no, that's all right. And believe me, you, after a while, a pastor finally says, for that person, suit yourself. I'm here. I'm ready. Suit yourself. Gratefully, you won't die before you get to make that choice. And that's the struggle that we have is because we're so often suiting ourselves to whatever brings us pleasure, whatever fleshly thing that we want to participate in, whatever, whatever it is. It's like going to a smart. We call them Borgesmart. And go down and shout out. You get to pick whatever you want. And how many of you pile it on a little bit more than if you were somewhere else at a buffet? There's just something about the idea that it's endless. It's endless. But yet Jesus Christ is endless. We don't necessarily fill our plates with Christ. And so this whole idea of the struggle between us serving ourselves or suiting ourselves up or, or you know, letting Christ lead us is that suit yourself problem. Joshua 24, 14 and 15 says it this way. Man. Now therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord, he says. This is Joshua. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day who you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers uh, served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? Amen. So Joshua is saying, you've got a choice to make, people. You're going to serve somebody, so why don't you serve the good God? If you want to serve the bad gods, suit yourself. But you know what? They made some good choices because we go on, and I don't even know if he has verse uh, eight, uh, 16. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great sights in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites, who dwell in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for He is our God. Man, they made the right choice. They made the right choice. Suit yourself, people, but we've got to choose to make the right choice. You've got to want to. Now, Christ can woo you, and He can give you opportunities. He can bring a neighbor that will come down three or four times and, and more or less try to convince you the idea that maybe Christ is okay, and will you accept Him? And suddenly He didn't say, suit yourself. But that's what I've got to say to you. If you aren't living for Christ and you've heard about Christ and you've been coming to church for years and you still aren't accepting Him as your Lord and Savior or you're choosing not to accept what He asked you to do and how to live, then suit yourself. Suit yourself. Live how you want to live. Just be honest with God and say no thanks. Be honest with Christ and say, you know what? You're seeing how I want to live, the, the choices I want to make. I, I want bits and pieces of you. And he said, you can't have just bits and pieces. You either serve me or you serve somebody else. Suit yourself, people. Suit yourself. Because that's what we're doing and that's what we're saying when we don't accept Christ or we don't accept what Christ wants for us when we say we accept him. Just to accept him means that, yes, you can be forgiven of your sin and you can have everlasting life. But there's more to it than that. So that's the beginning of the plan. The plan is that we now desire to serve him and desire to live how he wants us to live because we've chosen him as our Lord. But if we're not doing that, suit yourself. Live how you want to live. But when you come to the end, when God doesn't say, well done, good and faithful servant, or he separates us and, and I'm no longer a sheep, I'm now a goat. You've got to look and say, you know what? I think it's because I suited myself. Because I chose to live how I wanted to live. I chose to put on what I, the garments I wanted to put on because I enjoyed that or because I desired that. And so I tell you what, the Holy Spirit is kicking us in the hind end tonight. I have never felt such a strong conviction to make sure that you guys understand that either you accept Jesus Christ and, and his, his calling and his desires and his truth for you once and for all, or suit yourself, he says. If you want to go live in darkness, just be honest with him and say, you know what, thanks, but no thanks, I'm done. But he doesn't want that. And you shouldn't want that. Because the darkness is not a place you want to be. That's why Christ came, to give us that light, to be light of the world. He wants us to be the same, but I tell you what, sometimes we struggle, and I'll guarantee you as pastors, sometimes we scratch our heads and say, why is it so hard to feed something so wonderful to somebody? 
and you won't take and swallow it. Now, when I was a kid, mom tried to get us to swallow castor oil and things like that. That's understandable. And once you get a little taste of that, that's understandable. But Jesus Christ comes to give us that abundant life, comes to save us from ourselves, and yet we won't take and swallow what he has to offer. Well, sooner or later, he or I or somebody's going to have to say, save yourself. I'm tired of arguing with you. I'm tired of trying to beg you to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm tired of trying to beg you to accept all the good things that Christ has for you, to give you a good life, to prevent all the struggles that so many of us have gone through. We, how many of you have teenagers and say, please don't do that. I did that when I was young. I don't want you to have to go through that. Anyone go there? And your teenagers say, thanks, Mom and Dad. I'm going with what you say. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and parents sit back and worry at nights, pray, and wait, and hope, and say, Lord, please save my child until they come to the wisdom that I finally got. Well, I'm trying to save some of you from that tonight. You might be a, a living with Christ. You might have accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, but are you living for Christ? Or are we still living for ourselves? Because if we're living for ourselves, we've now suited ourselves up again. It's, it's us. Suit yourself. Christ says, put me on. And he doesn't say, go ahead and put me on. He says, put me on. So when we accept Jesus Christ, my friends, that's the beginning of a process, that transformation process. Too often we say, well, I know Jesus Christ. I've accepted the Lord and Savior. It's good to go. Yes, you will not end up in hell. But Christ says, hey, wait a minute. I've got so many other things for you to do. I've got so many other ways for you to live. If you truly accept me, you're going to put me on. And when you put me on, you're going to see a change in your life. And you're going to desire to have that change in your life. So if you're, accept, if you're coming to churches, if you're coming to church every week, if you're going three times a day, it doesn't matter. If you've never truly accepted him and aren't living for him, then you're living for yourself yet. You're saying, I, I'm going to decide what it's going to look like. God, I, I've got you here. I'm going to put you in my box, and I'm going to shove you over to this side because I've got this other expansion thing I'm doing. And I brought in this new hobby. I'm plugging that in there. Yes, you still got a spot in my life. He says, you give me everything. And then I'll go ahead and let you have some things in your life. And you, if you've accepted them as your Lord and Savior, say, thank you, Lord. You take charge. Ever go down the wrong road on your own? Whoa. Should we tell stories? Wow. Huh? Yeah, tough stuff. Tough stuff. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Hang on a second. It's the Great Commission. It's an interesting commission. And a lot of us read it and we hear it, but we don't necessarily jump on and do it. Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. So he's been given the authority and now he passes it on to us. I now charge you, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even at the end of the age. Wouldn't it be awesome if all we had to do was go out and tell people about Jesus and they'd say, Sign me up. Right. Just... Let me tell you about Jesus. Man, that sounds great. Sign me up. How many of you have went to talk to someone about Jesus and they said, no thanks? Man. So if it's so easy and so automatic, then we should see people coming to Christ because Christ wants that none would perish. But the struggle is, is that we still have free will and we can say, no thank you, Lord. And so we go to try to help someone come to know Jesus Christ and they say, thanks but no thanks. And we get so... We get so frustrated and we struggle with it because we know the gift and we've experienced the gift and we want them to have it too and they don't want it. And you got to, in your mind, and almost say, suit yourself. It doesn't mean you give up on them. But after a few times, I, I, I'll just be honest with you. After a few times, how much time do you have to spend on one person? There's a lot of people out there. How many, if I spend 40 hours a week trying to save one person, and that person doesn't want to be saved and will never choose to be saved is Satan got me spinning my wheels on the wrong guy. Right. That's a struggle. Because again, Christ wants that none would perish. But we've only got so much time. 
So Christ is saying, go out and make disciples of everyone, baptize them in my name. But we come to realize that it's not all set in stone. It doesn't mean that everyone you talk to is going to be accepting Christ because every one of us can sit here and say, someone talked to me, and I said no for a long time. Giving up too much stuff. You're asking too much. I kind of like the suit the way it is. Thank you very much. So we come to realize that there is a battle that takes place. You don't have to go far and realize there is a battle because most of us battled the battle. We fought against Christ. We didn't want to accept all that he had. We didn't want to accept and surrender who we are to him. And so come to realize that other people don't either. So if you say, I can't figure out why people won't accept Christ, go back in your B.C. days and say, well, why did I turn it down seven or eight times? But thankfully, they didn't say, suit yourself. But eventually, someone may. Eventually, we're, we're on our own. I mean, we have free will. We can make that choice. Christ can try to woo us and bring us out to where he wants us to be. But you know what? We have to choose to do it. They say you can lead a horse to water, but what? And make him drink. Make him drink. Even if they sit in this church for years, I can't make you drink. That's right. I can give you living water. I can share it each week. We can sing songs of praise that feed us also. But I can't make you drink it. You can maybe sip on it here, but what do we do outside these walls? This morning we talked about how we use our tongue, that we, we bless and we you know, praise God out of one, one aspect of our mouth, and we cuss and swear out of the other aspect. And how can those come out of the same hole? How can you have you know, salty water and fresh water on the same spot, the same spring? It's impossible. So we're saying that we live an altered life sometimes outside these walls. So we've nailed the door shut. We're all staying here forever. Huh? <laughs> Can I get this spot out of my shirt? I got pasta problems, yeah. Wouldn't that be something? Who signs up for that? Wow, yeah, nobody. We want to be outside these walls. But Christ says, go outside these walls and serve me. But the problem is, is we struggle with that because sometimes we suit ourselves and make our own choices and other times we run into people and we try to help them with Christ and they want to suit themselves and before long it's a struggle. You go on the fishing trip, Raymond went this year, you go up there with Jim Limmer, he's quite a fisherman, he's gone up there about 40 years and it's different fishing in Canada up there in Lake of the Woods because it's solid rock on the bottom. You have to use what they call bottom bouncers. It's a weight about two ounces and it's got a wire underneath it. What you do is you drop your line down, touch the bottom, reel it up slightly, and then you just keep trolling along and making sure that you touch the bottom so that your lure is right down there by the rocks. You can't cast out a, a Lindy rig or you can't cast out something and just sit there and say, I'm going to drag that along the, like a Lindy rig on the sand here in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, and wait for a walleye. You'll snag every time. And so Jim will usually get some new guy that's never been up there before, and, and he says, here's how you're going to fish now. And they say, oh, oh, I fished a lot in Minnesota. Right, Raymond? Yep. Oh, I got it figured out. It, I, I do it this way. I got my own way of doing it. And finally he says, suit yourself. And snag, snag, snag. And prayfully before long, because it drives us all nut in the boats, because you've got to stop and turn around so they can get it out of the rocks. Right. Gratefully, before long, they say, you know what, could I have that weight there? Could you kind of give me an idea what that was again? How's that work? Before long, if they'll do that, before long, we're fishing and enjoying life again. It's the same with us with Christ, my friends. We can fight against him and then wonder why we struggle in life or why we sit here so depressed looking when we're saved and we're the Christians. We're, if we're the light of the world, sometimes we look like we're about four watts. Maybe we got a light glow in the middle of the darkest of night. Man, we should be bright, full of excitement, full of Christ, full of victory, full of joy, realizing that when we make mistakes and we fumble and we fall down, that we can get back up, accept Christ again, say, you know what, Lord, I, I just want to repent. I just want to tell you I'm sorry. I, I got off the wrong track. Help me get back on the right track and know that we're forgiven. Man. There's a lot of places where you go to work, isn't it? I don't know about BTD, isn't it? But if you are late three times at BTD, you're gone. Isn't it something like that? Anyone that get fired there because you never got there? I heard it's something like that. Like, they're on you, and they're on you. Even when it's hard to find employees. 
And so that doesn't give you much grace or mercy. You mess up once, twice, you have a flat tire or whatever, they might just send you down the road. It doesn't seem fair, does it? You're trying. But with Jesus Christ, we're trying, and He knows we're trying. Because He looks at our hearts. And He doesn't throw us, He doesn't throw the towel, and He says, I know your heart. I see what you're trying to do. I, I see your efforts. And then He has grace and mercy for us so that we can move on. That's the God we have. That's the Christ that loves us, and He asks us to love Him. But see, it comes back to that again. Suit yourself. If you don't like it, suit yourself. Go somewhere else. If you're only here for the food downstairs, I tell you, you're wasting your time. Right. Stop by, we'll go to the door, we'll throw some food in a to-go box, and you might as well head on home. Because that's all you're here for, and that's all you're going to get. And I hate to say it, but that's what it is. I'm not going to tinkle around today because the Holy Spirit wants you to understand that there, you have to make a choice and then live the choice. Too far we've been playing games. We think we got all the time in the world. Johnny Jackson, 54 years old, probably thought he had as much time as most of us think we got coming up. Right. July 4th, 11.30 night, we get a call that he passed away. Just got done fishing on Big Pine Lake with his uh, son-in-law, or a son, I think, stepson. Came in the house, said, I'm running upstairs and changed my clothes before supper. Didn't come down. And that was it. So, when are you guys dying? Right. When are you? What's your plan date? Can you live another couple weeks in sin? Or can you, can you choose not to, to accept Christ for another three weeks? Because you at least got a month. You got at least half a month left. I got quite a bit of time because I got to pay my hospital bill, so they ain't gonna let me die. So let me. <laughs> I heard a story about a man that uh, the doctor said you have six months to live, and six months came by, and he said you got your bill paid, and the guy said no, not yet. And he said I'll give you another six months. <laughs> Isn't that kind of how we try to live our lives sometimes? How much time do we have left? I'm gonna ask you another tough question. You don't know that answer. I know you don't. Some of us might not even make it home. I might not make it off this podium. I might collapse, and that's all there is to it. Yeah. And I would be rejoicing, my friends, looking down on me next Sunday. But the other question is, if you die today, will Christ accept you into heaven? <clears throat> Have you truly accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I'm not talking about somebody else did it for you. I'm not talking about that you sat in a group and, and somebody said, should we do this? And you said, okay, I guess so. I'm talking about have you truly given yourself to Jesus Christ? And then the other question is, are you willing to if you haven't? Because if you're not willing to and you say, I'm not going to, first off, if you say, I don't need Christ, I need nothing to do with Christ. I love the atheists that say that. I want nothing to do with Christ. Really? Nothing. I want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And quit breathing. That's his air. It's his air. It's his son. Yes, you need Jesus Christ. And so for every one of us, we have to decide, have we truly accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior? So if we did not make it home tonight, would we go to heaven to be with him? If you don't know the answer to that, you can. But if you don't want Jesus Christ... If you truly don't, then just be honest with them and say, you know what, Lord, thanks, but no thanks. Don't bother me anymore. Don't come sit in a pastor to me. Don't come having sermons. I'm quitting coming to church because it's a waste of my time because I don't want to go. It's just a tradition. Tell them that. Be honest with them and then plan to go to hell. Not a good sermon. That's our options. Suit yourself. Christ doesn't want to say that to any one of us. He wants that none of us would perish. God sent His Son so that we don't have to die and go to hell. But we have to choose to accept Him as our Lord and Savior. Amen. We have to choose to accept Him and then we have to choose to strive to live like He wants us to live. This book of instructions is not to punish us. It's not to make our lives boring. It's not to make us seem like we're just dreary and drab. It means that we have a, instructions to live our life so we can have an abundant life without the pain and the suffering and all those things that most of us walk through prior to us coming to know Christ. It's a good book. It will help us to live a good life. 
So we have to know if we've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You have to accept Him. It wasn't done as a baby. You have to be born again. You have to choose to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Once you do that, then choose to be baptized so that you can publicly demonstrate that you've accepted Jesus Christ. But you also need to repent of your sins. <coughs> you need to say, you know what, Lord? Brian was talking about a spot or two on his shirt. Man, I'm filthy. I'm filthy. And you know what? He's Mr. Clean. There's nobody that's filthy enough for Christ. He's, he will take anybody and everybody. That's why he died. So that we can have that. Amen. And if you've accepted him again, and you find yourself making mistakes and slipping up, he is right there saying, you know what, just come and talk to me about it. Ask forgiveness. Let's work on you not doing it anymore, and let's move forward. That's the kind of God we have. He's not a rock. He's not a stick. He's not a star. He's not a crystal. He's Jesus Christ. And he loves every one of us. So I did about two pages of my sermon. You know, and somewhere we went where God wants to go. Amen. And I know it's some tough speaking. We want to come in and be cuddled, cuddled and teased and tickled and all these different things. But that again is suiting yourself. The truth is what we need to hear if you want to live. The truth is what we need to have so that we know how to live. But we have to accept the truth. It's not automatic. He wants it to be, but we have to choose to accept it. So bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, you're tough on us tonight. You speak a deep, hard truth. But you're the God of truth. Lord, I know that there are people sitting out here that maybe have never accepted you as their Lord and Savior. They don't need to come up to an altar to do that. That's kind of nice. We get to count your heads. They can do it right where they sit, Lord, because it happens in their heart and in their mind. So if there's anyone out here tonight that needs to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you're done playing the game, you're done suiting yourself, you're done kind of living halfway there and halfway there, you're trying to have two serve, you know, serve two masters, tonight, tonight you can change that. Choose to accept Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask if there's anyone else. Just raise your hand slightly if there is, just so I know who I can pray for. Anybody tonight that needs to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Now, is there anyone out here that says, you know what? There's a lot of times I don't put on Christ. I put on me. I suit myself. I choose how to live my day. I choose how to live my process. I choose... The things that I like, I make sure that they happen, but the things of Christ, I oftentimes set to the side. They're, they're too boring, they're too convicting. Right? Just, I just, I just, my flesh takes over. And you want to raise your hand for that part of who we are, that we suit ourselves. Yep. Aren't we good tailors? We all know how to make our own suit. Jesus says, take off that suit. Take off that suit and put me on. And how do you put him on? By learning his word. By being in prayer, by gathering together with like-minded people that want to speak life and love into you versus death and destruction. So Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone that sits here tonight, Lord, that you would just pour out your Spirit upon us in the greatest of ways, that you would open our inner ears to hear when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, to guide us and to direct us. I pray, Lord, that you put such a hunger in us that nothing satisfies us unless we're in your word, but that we're trying to live the way you desire to live. And Lord, if we start to veer off, that the alarm bells go off so strong, and there's such an uncomfortableness, Lord, it's like having that pebble in your shoe that drives you bananas, and you need to remove it. We need to start hating sin more. We need to start hating those things that tear us down and pull us away from Christ. We need to accept what you have for us, Lord, and reject what he the evil one has for us. So Lord, I ask that you pour this out upon everyone, Lord. Right now, just cover them, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Drench them, Lord, with your presence, your peace, your love, your provision, your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen, amen. amen and Amen. Who's coming back next week? <laughs> A few. That's good. We'll start over. Um, did you have anything to say about VBS? We have um, VBS coming up, Vacation Bible School for the kids, the 11th and 12th. That's not next weekend, but the weekend after. We are going to have a meal that night on the 12th at 5 o'clock, 
everybody's invited. So come join us, and then that night we'll have the program. So that's in two weeks. Um, on the 8th, which is a week from Wednesday, we have our real gathering at the Detroit Lakes Park by the Pavilion. The churches will furnish the food and, or the, the meat and the bun. So just bring a, Spam. <laughs> bring up a dish to share. So that's on the 8th at 6.30 in DL Park. Um, this Friday, any, any women that would like to join Sandy Marlette here at 2 o'clock, we're going to have a get-together. And it's just a time of sharing our day, and it's not a time of complaining or anything like that. It's a time of getting to know each other and sharing, sharing the word and just sharing time and, and just spending time together. So that's at 2 o'clock this Friday here. And Thursday nights, the guys have a Bible study going on. They're doing a study called, uh, what's it called? Man in the Mirror. Uh, so talk to Bob. Guys, you know, if, it, if tonight you're like, what just happened? Oh, what did Brian just do? It's not me. The Holy Spirit might be nudging you to say, you know what? You need some strength. You need some support. It's tough. It's tough out there. It's a tough life out there. So we need to support each other and love each other. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right. Come on up. We're going to sing Happy Trails. I never know when to...